Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So uh, welcome, and especially thanks to everybody. You pushed through the rain and you got here, and I'm grateful that you did, and I'm glad that you're here. So we're going to continue on in this series that we've been doing that we're calling Joy Full, and it's going to take us right back to the book of Philippians. That's been the book that we've been studying, and if you need a Bible, why don't you just uh, wave your hand at one of the ushers in any of our either of our rooms, and That way you can have one and you can uh, even keep that if you needed a Bible because you didn't have one. So we'll go to Philippians 2 um, in uh, just a moment. So um, I read a story about an army man who had uh, just been promoted to colonel. And he was sitting in his office and when somebody knocked on his door and identified himself on the other side of the door as Private Johnson. And he said, may I come in for a few moments? Well, the new colonel, uh, letting the moment kind of get to his head of his new appointment, he spun his chair around and wanting to look impressive, picked up the phone and he began holding the phone. And he said, yes, come on in. And even as the private walked in, he said into the phone, "Uh, yes, Mr. President, I understand, Mr. President. Uh, We'll take care of this. Mr. President, right about that time, he said, Mr. President, one moment. He said, Private, as you can tell, uh, th- I am busy. And this is very important. What, important. what is it? Make it quick. At which point the private said, yes, sir, Colonel. Uh, well, I'm just here uh, to connect your new telephone. So there's a verse in Proverbs 16, 18 that says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And so I think that's what we're going to be talking about today and we need to talk about this because Apostle Paul is going to get to this subject of pride and the antidote to it as we come into chapter 2 of Philippians. Now, pride is a tricky thing um, because it's insidious. It, it uh, sneaks in on all of our souls and gets to all of us, but it's a little bit like B.O. Uh, the problem uh, being that many times we don't notice it ourselves about ourselves. It's much more clear to those around us when we've got the problem, right? And that's how it is uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, with pride. And so... Um, But the reality is, it is a cancer of the soul that is devastating many marriages. Pride is making many workplaces miserable for employees. Pride even finds its way into churches and tears churches up from the inside out. And this uh, is actually... uh, roundaboutly what Paul was really trying to get at as he's writing this letter of Philippians. Let me give you the background before we read uh, chapter two. So there was this guy, Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus was the man who took the love offering that the Christians in Philippi had, had taken up for Paul over in prison. Epaphroditus is a messenger, and he takes the love offering over to Rome and, uh, so that Paul can have those extra funds uh, for, for his uh, needs while he there was in prison. And, <clears throat> but they don't just make that exchange. They have clearly uh, some conversations, and Paul is asking him, tell me a little bit about what's going on in Philippi with the Christians there. And apparently, at some point in that conversation, Epaphroditus said, well, and Paul, you should know there's a problem. Uh, it, particularly, there's these two people. He doesn't identify their names in chapter two, but he will by the time we get to chapter four. He'll identify their names. And he says there's, um, there's these two people, and they're really kind of at odds at each other. And that was enough to s- cause Paul to say, oh, no, 
We cannot be having that because that is where the seeds get planted of divisiveness, disunity, and that could tear the Christian church up. And so roundaboutly, this letter that we read to the Philippians that he sent back to the Philippians with Epaphroditus is not just a thank you letter for the love offering that they had taken for him, but it was also a very strong word about this disunity problem that he had just learned was sneaking into the church at Philippi because he said, we've got to arrest that. And at the nub of it, you're going to find pride. That's what he's uh, basically telling them. Now, what's the antidote to pride? The antidote is humility. So let's read what he wrote in chapter two. Okay, starting in verse one. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love and being one in spirit and one in mind. He's just saying from, from his Roman prison, oh, please, please, please get it together, be unified. Don't let me hear any more of, of things coming apart uh, just because a couple of you are at odds with each other. He says in verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In verse five, then he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made into human likeness. Verse eight, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now what Paul is saying in this uh, section, he's telling us really three things. If you're gonna break free from pride, you're gonna have to get three things. Let's crack the code, all right? So if you're a note taker, here's the first one. The first thing he's saying is you're gonna have to realize it's not about you. He's saying that in verse four. Stop looking to your own interests and start caring for the interests of others. Why? Because it's not about you. That's hard for us, isn't it? Because we want it to be about us. I remember when I was in um, high school, my uh, world, I wasn't the pastor. I didn't even thought about being a pastor when I was in high school. Um, my world revolved around music. And that's really what I did. I'm a keyboard guy, a piano guy. And uh, so I was always uh, getting accolades and attention and awards and things like that for d d music. And uh, there was a lady who called one day and she said, I would like for you to come because I'm having this big party and here's where it's going to be. And I need four hours of background music and I'll pay you this amount. And I was like, wow. I said, yes, I'd be happy to. Somehow in my mind, I, I just didn't have quite in mind that you're not going to do a concert for all of these people for this money. You're going to be background music for these people. So I got there and got my bottle of water and she said, oh, the piano's over there and you just go do your thing. So I sat down and I began to play and I was playing along and the people started coming. And they came and they came and more and more people and they're walking around with their plates of hors d'oeuvres and their drinks and, and they're walking right by me, but not a one of them's looking at me. Not a one of them's saying, hey, how are you? Not a one of them saying, wow, you're really good at that. Nothing. And it was driving me crazy because here I am playing my heart out and I ain't even trying to figure out some songs that are like, maybe this one will finally bring the house down. You know, and, and so I'm, I'm doing my best to get, it, to, to get it to be about me. And it was not about me. And it was so frustrating. By the end of the night, I wanted to stand up on the piano bench and say, hey, you have everybody if you haven't noticed, I've been over here working the ivories for four hours and my back is sore and you ain't giving me nothing. How about a little praise right about now, please? But it wasn't about me. And that's what Paul was saying here. 
you're going to have to, 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 to come to a realization. It is not all about you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vanity, vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others more than yourselves. Look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Right? I'm sure you've seen the news this past week that uh, the great evangelist Billy Graham, at age 99, uh, finally went to be with Jesus. Um, you know, I don't think I've talked about it here before, but his life and ministry really had a big impact on my life. I remember when he came to Houston to do one of the big um, revivals for a week, and he was at Rice Stadium. And by the way, if you're younger than 20 or 25, you, you really haven't any idea of, of who he was and what he did. But suffice it to say, uh, because many of you, you do know, you certainly know Ben and you know Breakaway and, and maybe Passion and Louie and Matt Chandler and Francis Chan and these kind of guys. Before there was any of those guys, there was Billy Graham. And he would go from city to city and there would be stadiums full of people who would come and he would preach the gospel and invite people to accept Christ. And I remember going and I was just 15, I think, and I remember most every night I secured a ride either with my parents or somebody who'd get me there. And I remember sitting up in the upper uh, balcony there at Rice Stadium and just riveted by uh, what was going on because it was a moment. One of the things that um, I've noticed in all the readings that I've done, the articles and the little pieces I've watched on his life because I've just found myself feeling a little bit of it, since obviously he'd had that impact. Oh, and I should have mentioned, I didn't mention, what was the impact exactly. Uh, I had already trusted in Christ at that point in my life, but, um, but every night when he'd give the invitation and say, now I want you to come out onto this football, every night, whoever I was with, I was like, I'm going down there. They're like, but you keep doing this over and over. How many times are you going to keep doing this? Haven't you accepted Christ? Oh, yes, that's not why I'm going. I just want to be down there close to where God is working. And I look back now and I realize, in hindsight, what I couldn't have articulated then, but even then I realize now the Holy Spirit was already giving me the first inklings of a call that would eventually come very clear to me, a call into full-time ministry. So like I was saying, I, I, uh, this past week I was reading various articles and so on his life, and I was struck with how recurringly the word humble or humility always comes through the articles. Um, in fact, uh, one of his 19 grandchildren uh, wrote a piece, and in it he said, I've been in the room where Daddy Bill was speaking on the phone to the President of the United States, and then later got up to pull the chair out for the housekeeper, whom he regularly invited to join him and Ruth for dinner. Uh, humility. As a matter of fact, my father, some years ago, had opportunity to, uh, through a course of meetings that he was attending for a couple of days, to interact with one of Billy Graham's uh, colleagues. And so dad, uh, who'd also had an impact felt upon his life through Billy Graham's ministry when he was younger, he asked the man to tell a story. And he said, well, I'll tell you one story. He said, uh, I remember how it was when we would be backstage before we would go out into the stadium and, you know, he would preach the gospel. While the music and all is going on and we're backstage, and you would think that Billy Graham had been back there and, and just getting his snacks and letting people pat him on the back and say, well, you're going to do great. And you, would you get an autograph for my kid, you know, by the way? And that's not where he was. And I said, no, Billy Graham was laid out flat, on the floor, face to the mat. And the rest of us would go there with him as well, just praying, God, would you come in power? And apparently Billy Graham would say, we must humble ourselves and not let this moment get to us. Because if pride overcame us, our lips could turn to clay just like that. It's all about Jesus. That's what Paul was telling the Philippians. It's, it's not about you, people. You've got to get that in your mind if you're going to have any hope of humility. That's the first thing. And then the second thing that he's going to tell us is, and it's going to be all about serving. It's not about you, but it is all about serving. 
It's got to have everything to do with servanthood. Look at verse 6. He says, in very nature, God, though he was, he didn't consider equality God with something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing and took the form of a servant. Paul is saying, think of this. Consider this. Here you have God in the flesh, Jesus, First of all, you have to understand something. I've seen a lot of people have a misunderstanding. We tend to think that there was God the Father, and he was all by himself, and then one day he said, I'm sending my son, and he created it, and Jesus gets born, and they're like, whoa, now there's two of them. You know, and it's, but that's not the way it was. The Bible makes clear there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always, the Trinity always from the very beginning. And so you had the pre-incarnate Christ who was there before he came into this earth. He was used to the praises of the angels uh, being showered upon him. This is what Paul is so struck by. He says, you've got to get in your mind how significant this is. He didn't cling to his rights as uh, part of the Godhead as God himself. He didn't cling to those rights as if they, 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 they were something that he had to hang on to and use to his own advantage. No, he forsook those. And he agreed to come into this earth taking the form of a man that has all of the challenges that our human bodies have, meaning we have problems, we have hurts, we have pain, we have illness, all of these. Not only that, not only did he take the form of a, of, a, of a human, taking the form of a man, he allowed his glory to be veiled. So that it's not like when he was walking around here on planet Earth, people were like, oh, wow, that's God. No, because he allowed his glory to be veiled. And then Paul says, that not only that, he... He became the servant. Look at what he did. He just, he just gave his life serving. He didn't worry about getting his own home. He didn't worry about getting his own wife. And it, it was all about others. And he was serving others. He was serving even the children. Let the children come to me. He just gave his life away. And not only did he just become the, 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 the quintessential servant, he even went to death. And not just any death, he went to death on the cross. And that's what Paul said. You gotta realize, <laughs> if you're gonna have any hope of humility, you're gonna have to put your eyes on Jesus and look at what he did. Look how far he came down. We talk about upward mobility, but Paul's saying, oh no, no, see, this was downward mobility that was going on here. Several days ago, I got a text from Sammy Walker saying, Jack is um, back in the you know, hospital. And I should tell you, Jack and Sammy are two of our founding members. Jack is 86 now. She said he's having a little problem. Well, I decided uh, that evening, well, I'll, I'll run by and, and say hi. And so we sat there for, I sat there, he was in his bed. And we talked for a little while and reminisced and after a while, I, I went over by his bed and took his hand, and I said, well, let me pray for you now, Jack. And I prayed for him that God would heal him and touch him and comfort him. So, And, and before I could say, in Jesus' name, amen. He wouldn't let go of my hand. He squeezed my hand. He said, now, now Lord, I want to pray for my pastor. He's my leader. He's my shepherd. I'm praying for him. And he began to pray for me. And I found something inside of me thinking, well, I, I just, you, you shouldn't be wasting any of your strength on me. I, I'm fine. You're the one who's, who's here in the bed. And yet, he wasn't going to let my hand go until he had served me in prayer. But, you know, that was not the first time I had seen the servant heart of Jack Walker. Because even as I was walking out to my car in the parking lot afterwards, my mind went back, what, nearly 20 years ago when we were starting the church and we were over at the Cleb Intermediate School. And he and Sammy would have been approaching 70, I guess, even back then. I remember even telling him, I'm so glad that you are here and that you want to be here, but you know something. I, look, you're, you've had a great 
victorious life and career and you're retired and if anybody's earned the right to sit in a comfortable padded pew of an existing uh, church that it would be you you don't have to be here doing this setting up and this tearing down that we do every week and it, it, you know it wouldn't hurt my feelings and they said Ken <laughs> we're here because we want to be where the Holy Spirit is alive and well and the Holy Spirit's alive and well that's why we're here at Faith Bridge. And so one morning I was walking into Kleb Intermediate School where we were gonna have the services. And I remember approaching that east uh, patio outside the cafetorium where we would meet. And even as I was walking in, I looked and I saw there was Jack Walker and he had a dustpan and he had a broom and he was picking up the Dorito wrappers and the Coke cans and everything that the kids had left around at, at Kleb. And as I approached, I said, Jack, what are you doing? He said, well, kid, we got a lot of new people who are going to come to church today. We've got to make it look right for them, don't we? You know, as I walked past uh, and as I've journeyed through the years, uh, I can't for the life of me think of what in the world I preached that day about in my sermon. But I have never forgotten the sermon that Jack preached to me in that moment of his servanthood. Paul's saying, look, if you, if you uh, want to conquer this pride thing, you're going to have to realize, number one, it ain't about you. Number two, it is about serving. And if your life doesn't have any of that, heaven help you if you're trying to get to humility. You're going to have to realize it has everything to do with serving. Um, and that leads to a third thing then. The third thing, which I guess is triggered by the question, why, why don't we do this? Because even when you hear a story like that, you're like, well, I want to be like him. I want to do it. But why don't I do that? I'll tell you why. It has to do with the third thing. It's going to require some dying. It's going to re humility requires dying. And that's what happened to Jesus, right? In verse uh, 8 and 9, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave, gave him a name that's above every name. It's going to require some dying. Now, when I say dying, I'm not talking necessarily a physical death. And for Jesus, it certainly was that for our sakes. I'm talking just death to our ego, death to our plans, death to our schedule. There's going to require some dying that goes on if we're going to get to this thing of humility. Because we spend otherwise so much time and so much energy making it all about us and trying to get people to say, how, how am I doing? How am I doing? Am I doing good? Give me some feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels good. Get a little bit more, a little bit more. Oh, good. Now it's feeling good. Now I'm feeling joyful. Now I'm feeling joyful. And what Paul is saying, now, so you have to realize, you're going to have to die to that. But if you would die to that, you would find real, lasting joy. How do we do that? We have to come to a realization of, of something that Jesus understood so clearly. I want to show it to you. It's not in this passage. You've got to jump over to the book of Mar uh, John. So turn back, if you want, to the, uh, to the book of John, the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 13. An interesting thing. Now, here's the setting. Here's the context. Okay, so you have uh, Jesus the, getting ready to go to the cross. The night before he goes to the cross, what does he do? He organizes a special supper, the Last Supper, we call it. And he's got this special room that they're going to have the Last Supper in, and all the disciples are going to be there, and he's going to be there. And it was customary in those days for there to be a servant who would be waiting at the door who would wash your feet because you wore sandals in those days. They didn't have concrete, and so you had to dust all in your feet and maybe some dung that you'd walked across on the roads. It's just the world it was. And you'd slip your sandals on, they'd wash your feet, and you'd go on into it. And they get to the Last Supper, and there's no servant, only the host. And Jesus does something that confounded them. What does it say he does? In chapter 13, he says he got up and he took the towel in the basin and he began to go around and he began to wash their feet. And that begs the question, 
How could he do that? John gives us the answer. Three things. You see it in verses four and five. Let me read the verses to you and then we'll just uh, talk about it briefly. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and that he was returning to God. And therefore, he got up and he washed their feet. Now, what's he saying? He's saying three things. Jesus understood so clearly where he had come from. He understood so clearly where he was going. And he understood so clearly in the meanwhile what his purpose was. He was mission clear. There was no confusion. And that's why he was so free to serve, to do the lowliest thing that only a servant otherwise would tend to do. See, Jesus was freed up from having to have any false pretenses. He was freed up from having to, to get people to say, hey, come on, come on, come on, treat me like a Messiah. After all, I need a little bit here. He was freed up that, why? Because he knew where he was from, he knew where he was going, and he knew why he was here. The reason I'm pointing this out is because I'm telling you, friends, if you're fuzzy on this, if you're fuzzy about who you are on the inside, you'll never get to humility because you'll grasp for the most logical, natural thing that you can point to. Look at my resume. Look at this trophy. Look at what I did. Give me some strokes here. Give me some feedback. Why? I'm desperate. I won't feel good if you don't give it to me because I'm hollow on the inside. I don't know where I'm from. I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know what I'm even here for on earth. But if you can get Christ put in the right place of your soul, and you begin to realize my identity comes through him. I'm from him, I'm going to him, and the meanwhile I'm here to serve him. There's a quiet joy that comes into our spirits and frees us up to rise above any of the, the, the pretenses that we've always felt so compelled to put up in front of people so that they think we're really so great, so that they think we're really talking to the president and all sorts of important things that make us feel better about ourselves than we really feel. It all has to do with getting our identity clear. You show me anybody who is always talking about themselves whether they're talking about how good they are, whether they're talking about how bad they are. Because this pride thing can come in either way. It's still about you, isn't it? Look at all the things that I've done. I'm, I'm the chairman of this board. I'm on these boards as well. And I've been the CEO of this and that. That's pride. I'm no good at this sort of thing. I'm really very bad at this. And, and I, I'm very you know, insecure about these sorts of things. And do you think I'll be able to do That's pride. It's just flipped over and presenting itself in a very insecure, it's still about you. The subject is you. But if you could really find your identity in Christ, if we could really find our identity in Christ, that's where the liberation comes. And we're freed up to experience this joy that says, I can wash your feet. It doesn't matter. I can serve. Easier said than done, isn't it? It is. Just on time, the way the Lord's always faithful to do, he gave me a chance to live the sermon before I preach the sermon. Um, so this past week, I think it was Thursday, that was the day that I'd set aside to write the sermon. And it was just perfect. It was the only free day that I had. I'd blocked the whole thing out, no meetings, no nothing. And typically I do my writing at home because I have a little closet at, or a little, little um, study at home. It's about the size of a closet. It feels cozy to me, but Suzanne says it feels claustrophobic. But I love it, and I get a lot of things done in there. And so I was going to be in my study, and I had my commentaries and my Bible and everything all out, and I was going to study this passage that we've been talking about and what Paul was saying and what I was going to say. And, and I had eight whole hours. I was like, this is a, it's a perfect day. So just before I was getting going, I was getting my coffee all mixed up, and I looked out, and I noticed that Suzanne's van had a tire that was low in air, if not altogether flat, which was the tire that I had put some air in the previous week. And so I mixed my coffee up, and as I walked by her going back to my study, I said, hey, by the way, you're going to need to run by discount tire uh, because I think you may have a flat tire. That wouldn't be safe for you to be out on. And, and so I went and got my books out, and I began to study and, and get going on what I had to do. Right about then, she, she came to me, and she said, now, um, 
I, I'm happy to go get the tire fixed and everything, but it's best I can remember, the, the you know time or two before when I've done the car stuff, you've kind of got on to me because you felt like I got snookered and I paid too much money and got stuff we didn't really need. And you sure you don't want to go do the tire thing? And I, oh, no, 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 no. I've blocked out this day. And I got a sermon to write and it's important and, and, and I'm important. I'm not a car guy. I, I'm a preacher and I got to say important things to these people uh, coming up this Sunday. And so, no, I can't do it. You, you'll do fine. You just, you just say no thanks to anything they try to sell you and you'll do just fine. And she said, well, all right. And well, a few minutes later, I heard her voice one more time. She said, Kenny, I noticed you've, you've got these books that you're just sitting there reading. And you, you don't think you'd want to just put all those books in a satchel and just, just go over to Discount Tire? And you could sit right there and you could do the reading right there. And then we'd all be confident that we bought the right things for the car. Even at that point, I knew she had me. I, I wasn't excited about it, but I could feel the whispers of the Holy Spirit say, that was really a good point that she just made there. You know, and, and so I was formulating my reply right in that moment. This, this hubristic part of me that's resistant. Oh, no, 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 this is much more important than just doing that sort of thing. Even in that moment, I felt the Spirit of the Lord say to my spirit, not audibly, but the thought just came to my mind. Really? Do you really think that you're sitting here for eight hours would yield more fruit in your disobedience than I could give you in five minutes of inspiration if you would just take the towel in the basin and you just go and serve your wife and do what Ephesians says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. I could give you in five minutes minutes, the whole thing. But I can guarantee it's not coming if you're sitting there just being defiant about it. Paul was saying, if you're ever going to get to humility, it, it, it is not going to be about you. It is going to be about serving. And there's going to be some dying. Some dying to your plans, to your desires, to your wants, to your schedule, to your way. There's going to be some dying along the way. It might mean for you a major sort of thing. It might be sort of minor. Like you'll end up spending a bit of the day sitting at discount tires as I did that day. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because look what Paul says there in those final verses. He said, but after Christ had done what he was sent to do, what did God do? He raised him up exalted him above every other name so that at the, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Why is it so? Why is he high and lifted up? Because he humbled himself. He came and lived the life of sinlessness that you and I wouldn't live, couldn't live, can't live. And he died the death of punishment that you and I all deserve. He stood in our places, our sacrifices, our substitute. And then on the third day, God raised him up. And now he's exalted. It's roundaboutly what Peter would say in 1 Peter uh, 5, 5 and 6. He would say, here's the deal. People, here's the deal. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You don't want to be in opposition to God. Don't be, if you're proud, he's against you. Don't be proud. He gives grace to the humble, though. So humble yourselves, Peter said, and in due time, he will lift you up. That's Paul's word to us today. My challenge. Now, let me just say one closing remark. I know the temptation after a message like this is, is we sort of roll our sleeves up and say, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be more humble this week. That ain't going to happen. I'll tell you why it's not going to happen. Because if that's what you're putting your mind on, if that's what you're focused on is I've got to be more humble, already by default you're not being more humble. You're being more self-consumed. See, it's kind of insidious the way this works. It's sort of elusive, humility is. If you take dead aim for it, it starts moving on you. 
And, and, and so you can't take dead aim for it or else now you're just thinking about her there. I did it for an hour. Woo, I was humble. I didn't talk about me one time. You know, but now you're doing the very thing that you're trying not to do, right? So what do we do? We have to put our minds, our eyes on Jesus. We have to change the subject. That's where humility is found. That's where it comes from if we We'll just lift our eyes and say, now I'm going to look to you, the author and the perfecter of my faith, Lord Jesus. I'm turning to you. You are my all and all. That's where the humility happens. And it's also why we felt like it would be just the perfect day for us to culminate our service with the Lord's Supper. Because in the Lord's Supper, what did Jesus do? He left us tangible signs or symbols um, so that we could access the gospel and what he did for us in coming, in dying. He, he gave us these symbols the, the night that he was with those disciples. After he washed their feet, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, now this represents my body. This is my body. It's broken for you. I want you to take it. And as you do, you're going to remember what I've done for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. I want you to drink of it, all of you, when you come together. And so we're going to uh, come to the Lord's table right now. Let me just um, mention a, a couple of things that tend to come up, especially if you're new or if a guest. Um, sometimes people say, am I invited here? I mean, I'm not a member here. This is my first time or my second time. I never did this here before. Is this like, am I, am I in? It's not a faith bridge table. It's the Lord's table. And so if you have a love and a relationship with the Lord or you want to starting today, then you come. It's for you. And then uh, sometimes people say, well, so how like technically, how do you do it here? Some places you do this. Or, what do I do? Well, you just come and you'll get one of the gluten-free crackers at one of the stations at the very front in both our rooms. And then you take that cracker and you dip it into the grape juice and then you'll partake. And the ushers are gonna be leading you so they'll even sort of prompt you, now's a good time for you to go in a moment. And I hope you'll do two things then after you've come to one of those stations. I hope first of all, you'll spend some time in prayer. Uh, we turn these steps in both rooms at the front into our altar. You just humble yourself and come before him and talk with him. If you need somebody to pray with you, our prayer partners will be here and they, the prayer partners tend to wear the red shirts. They'd be happy to come and pray with you about anything that you signal them for. And then the other thing is I, I would ask you, uh, when you're done, you go on back to your seat and let's just finish the singing and let everybody respectfully kind of finish together rather than sort of all heading for the door uh, like cattle, which becomes a little disruptive. And then we'll all be done in a few moments. All right, let me pray for us. Lord, now would you come and meet us in this moment? Now, thank you, God, for the chance to talk about this word in Philippians, how important it is that we address this problem of pride. It's humility that we want, but there's a lot that goes into it. Lord, at the core of it, though, is you. If we would just put our eyes on you, Jesus, 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 the rest takes care of itself. Lord, would you put our eyes on you, put our minds and our hearts on you. If you've never said yes to Jesus in the first place, I invite you even in these final moments of the service, you just say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from unrighteousness and fill me full of your Holy Spirit and teach me what it means to follow after you. And for the many of us who've, who've done that before, Maybe our prayer is, Lord, would you just take my eyes off of me? Even in these moments of coming to the Lord's table, would you make them holy moment? Help me to connect with you and to put my eyes and my heart and my mind back on you because the rest takes care of itself if I would just keep focused on you. Help me have that assurance of my identity in you. We pray all of these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, as the ushers lead in both rooms, come now.
Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Justin Teague. I am the Worship and Communications Pastor at FaithBridge, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just finished part three of our Joyful series, and the working title of this was The Quiet Joy of Humility, Right. which is actually my first question right out of the shoot. Okay. Why quiet joy? Well, because humility is a quiet thing. Um, there are situations in life that bring about what you might consider a loud joy, where you're getting uh, plaudits and, and attention and this sort of thing. But what we were talking about today is cutting against all of that, right? And we're saying, if we're really uh, doing what Paul was writing to the Philippians, and we're coming down um, there's an inner sense of I'm doing what I am called to do. I'm being who I'm called to be. And there's a joy in that, but it's not a loud joy. There's a quiet uh, joy to it. That's good. Yeah. So we have a couple more questions sure. on action steps, on evangelism. Uh, right out, uh, the second one is a, is a matter of definition. Okay. I think a lot of um, times we can confuse hubris and pride, because sometimes they mean the same things, but sometimes sure. they don't. Is there such a thing as, as a healthy pride? Right. Yeah, well, right, and that word can be, especially if your uh, toddler is just learning how to walk, and I'm so proud of you in this sort of thing. Um, well, I think uh, the, the question comes back to what is at the center? If you are at the center, we probably have Houston, there's a problem. We have a problem. If what you're celebrating is somebody else's success, um, then that's a different thing altogether. I'm proud of you for what you did. I'm just feeling this great sense of, uh, of uh, pride in what you do. I think it has everything to do with what is at the center. Hmm. So. One of the stories I didn't tell was a story uh, about a an old Scottish preacher, Alexander White, of whom it was said, uh, gosh, I think this is well a century ago, a man came in to him and said, Dr. White, I uh, just wanted to tell you there's an evangelist in town and he is saying that such and such, pastor such and such in our community is not a Christian. And Alexander White stood up and said, the nerve of him coming into our town and saying he's not a real Christian. But then the man said, but I also need to tell you, Dr. White, he says, you're not a Christian either. At which point White sat down and he said, then you need to leave and I need to allow the Lord to search my heart. Now, what was the difference? He was ready to protect someone whom he knew and loved, but when the indictment was for him, he understood what Paul is talking about, the no reputation, making himself of no reputation. Hey, I'd better check to make sure that I'm really all in for Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I think the same can be true, flipping it over back to this question. Um, if our pride is all in me, that's the problem. Mm. If my pride is about you, then praise the Lord, we're celebrating what God's doing inside of you. Excited about that. That's a very helpful lens to look at that. Um, the final point, or one of the final points you made, was the danger of making it uh, a goal to be less humble yeah. through sheer will. Right. Uh, what would my action step be? How do I how do I take that step? What would my prayer be uh, if I know that that is actually something that I, I'm struggling with? Which it is for all of us, all the time. Well, I, th I think it's really two things. First of all, um, 
we're filling up with him, not with ourselves. See, that's, that's the whole thing. We want to inflate ourselves, but we're saying, no, I'm filling up with you. And then secondly, we're emptying ourselves through serving. And so there's this kind of, uh, I guess you get sort of a breathing exercise. I'm taking in, I'm reading his word, I'm spending time in prayer and committing myself to, and then I'm going out and I'm looking for opportunities to serve. Because if I'm uh, actively pursue, uh, pursuing opportunities to take a, 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 a dustpan and a, and a broom, or a towel in a basin and wash feet, then I'm going to certainly be making more progress hmm. than if I'm just sitting there uh, sort of putting little marks on the ledger. And I think this was a pretty good hour and this sort of thing. So we have to replace that um, with filling up with him and then going out and, and, and serving. Jesus gave us an example of this. Uh, though in a different context uh, in which we're in right now of Lent, mm. talking about when you fast, do so quietly. Quietly. Don't, you don't need to tell everybody. Yeah, you don't need to tell everybody you're fasting. How, how good I am. How spiritual about, you are. Uh, yeah, fasting. right. Good. Uh, well, one other practical outworking of this, uh, of many, uh, that could trip us up is uh, evangelism. Mm. Sharing my faith. Uh, am Am I not having hubris if I come to you and say, I, I've actually got a, a, a way. I, I got I know, the answer. I know something that you don't know. Right. Uh, how do I do that yeah. with humility? Sure. Well, and it does require humility because it is possible for uh, the Christian to have a witness that is not winsome, that's repulsive. Um, and that Christian may be accurate in the information that they're sharing, but the spirit out of which it's coming is, is, is filthy. And that tarnishes uh, the message. I think the best uh, example that I've heard is the example uh, that I think it was Moody or Finney told, saying, Christianity is nothing more than one beggar finding food and going to his friends and saying, I found the source of food. You've got to come and see what I've discovered um, because here is our provision. And, um, and that's what we are as followers of Jesus. If we've really got the right, if we've got the gospel really in us, then our tone isn't a boy. It's, I sure am glad I'm not you. Let me tell you what you've got to do. No, no, no. I would even question right there. Are you really, is that the gospel or is that more like pharisaicalism? Mm -hmm. um, because you're a beggar who just by God's grace, he's shown the blessings of food. And he said, here's how you have life. And I've provided for you. And we're just going and saying, I got to tell you. I got the greatest news, um, and it will change your life. Here's what it's done for mine. Mm -hmm. I think if that's the tone, there won't be hubris, uh, but there'll just be a, uh, I don't know, a godly uh, urgency and excitement of, mm -hmm. about the good news that we're sharing. Thank you, Pastor Ken. What a refreshing word, a good word, a great series. Can't wait till next week. Uh, and. Can't wait to see you next week. We'll be right here at Postscript. See you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.